Welcome. This is Brooke Klontz and Carly Dalton. Today we have JL with us. She is the New York Times bestselling author of Wings of Ebony, which is available on Amazon and anywhere books are sold. She is going to give you the tools necessary to get published and be successful. I'm really excited to have her with us today. So JL, tell us a little about Wings of Ebony and how it inspi what inspired you to write it. Um, I actually have one here, so I can show it to you too. Thank you for that intro, Brooke. Um, <laughs> Wings of Ebony is a young adult fantasy novel that is uh, very much straddles the contemporary fantasy space and a little bit of um, high fantasy because there's there's two worlds in the book that the main character sort of teeters between. But it's the story of a girl who, after her mother's mur murdered on her doorstep, she's taken away to an island of magic wielders by her estranged father. And while there, she's the only half human, half God. And she uncovers this plot that is uh, threatening her home back in, in, her, in the human world. And so she has to lean into her ancestors' magic to protect both of her homes. Um, and that's, it's very, uh, it's very action packed um, and it's very fast paced. It's very thrilling. And so if you like sort of that suspenseful experience reading, that's very much sort of the tone of it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think I already told you when I, I finished it in two days and it honestly would have been one day if I didn't need sleep but I was like kind of starting to like doze off I'm like okay put it down but the next morning I woke up it was Saturday Sunday next morning I woke up and I'm like and done it was almost like went by too fast <laughs> thank you I am I am excited for people to get their hands on the sequel because in the oh, sequel as the last iteration in Ruth's story I wanted to slow it down just a smidge so people can kind of you know I just it's like your last time with Ruth. So I'm like, let's make it a little, you know, less fast. Let you soak it all in. So I'm excited. Mm -hmm. The sequel is a little bit longer than the first book. Oh, good, good. That's great. <laughs> it is a very fast paced novel, uh, which I love. It's a total mm -hmm. big turner. Oh yeah, for sure. But so, so what character would you say that you identify most with? Oh goodness. I think I'm a mix of them. I, I definitely have some Rue in me. Um, some, some of that obstinate, stubborn determination. Um, and then I end just this fierce desire to protect the people that I love and care about. Uh, family, found family, friends, neighbors, whomever, fill in the blank. Um, and then I definitely have some Miss Leola in me too. Like if you come to my house, you're leaving with a plate, a styrofoam container for you and your whoever didn't make it over with you. So I think there's, you know, there's a mix of characters in there um, that I think embody me. I have a little bit of Ruth's father in me too. Um, I know, like, because I do have three children. So I, I realized, like, when I was writing a sim, I was pulling from, I mean, I was definitely, like, exaggerating things from my own personality, but there were pieces of him that I understood, like, as a parent that I pulled from to write that relationship. Interesting. Yeah, I think it's, like, just as a child or a kid looking at it, you'd be like, you'd want to blame him, you'd want to make him the bad guy, you know, he left or whatever. But yeah, as a parent, okay, but he had his reasons, you know, you didn't yeah. just do it out of spite. Yeah. Motive. Yeah. Perfect. Well, one thing I really loved about um, Rue and Bree's relationship is I feel like it came, yes, they're best friends, ride or die, but it also came with some real life complications. And so I wanted to know kind of what inspired you to go the route that you did with the relationship and was there anything you were hoping to achieve by it? Oh, absolutely. So I knew, you know, I'm writing a book about racism mm -hmm. that it necessitates a conversation about privilege and allyship, authentic allyship. And so once I had circled around to this idea that the antagonist was this sort of, is this a spoiler free chat? I mean, I th people know if there's gonna be a little bit of a spoiler, but I really wanna hear, and I think other people are gonna really wanna hear. Okay. You okay. So put spoiler on it. Spoiler, <laughs> sorry guys. Spoiler alert. <laughs> um, so I think that, you know, when we're exploring sort of this, this racist human who's sort of the source of the brutality on Rue's community. Um, it was important for me to look around at the people in Rue's life and really analyze how they are supportive of that or how they support and propagate that because I don't think there is neutrality in these situations and I think that that's a, a, a very um, sort of obvious parallel to the real world and I wrote this in 2018 before 2020. Wow. Um, by the time the world began to fall apart in 2020 publicly, because the things that happened in 2020 happen all the time, it's just now, you know, it's being filmed and, and, and thank goodness, right? Um, and so it's getting more national attention, but the problems are prevalent. The police brutality in my community, racism in general, and the insidious ways that it affects my community is, is present in there. I mean, I wrote this book in 2018. 
it was done being edited in 2019. So it was on its way to press as I was watching the, the, um, the world fall apart. And it was just like, I just remember seeing just a mix of reactions in the world and thinking, oh my gosh, like that's someone who is, you know, thinks they're an ally and they're not. And so I was very um, eager to see how the world would digest my book given what it, it was published on the heels of the 2020 tragedy of the killing of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and so many. Um, and so I didn't, I, I can't say that I wrote it because of that uh, specifically because that hadn't happened yet, but in so many ways that had happened, right? Just not um, getting the national and public attention that it, that it deserved. And so I think that um, I understood this tie between racism and allyship and the importance of having that conversation. And I wanted to write a bold um, exposition of that while also kind of um, doing it a little differently from how I've seen it done before. So The Hate You Give was a big inspiration for me. I love Angie Thomas's work. And one of the things I loved about Thug was um, she had, goodness, what is her name? Haley, maybe? It was the white girl who said to, um, in the movie at least, said to Star, pretend like the basketball is a piece of fried chicken. And it was one of those moments where it's like, oh, see, you know, like it's, it's microaggression and racist things like that, that I think are becoming sort of more publicly known as, oh, that's okay. You don't say that to someone. Mm -hmm. But then what about sort of the subtle things that Brie does to sort of um, dig in her friend unintentionally? Mm -hmm. And so I wanted to have a conversation about those things, about the people who look at Haley and go, well, I'm not Haley. I would never say that to a black person. Um, that's not where the line is drawn. There's more. And so I thought it was a great continuation of that conversation. Um, and I wanted to specifically explore it through someone who we know who truly loves Rue. I think that was an important um, person to have that. I, I wanted the message to be embodied by someone who we don't question their authenticity. I wanted readers to love Rue. I wanted, I mean, to love Brie and Rue, but I wanted readers to fall in love with Brie's heart and then be able to see, oh, wow, you can have the best intentions and screw up royally. Um, because I think that's a needed message. I think um, at the end, it was such a powerful moment is when she says, when Brie says, if I screw up again and Rue interrupts, she goes, when you screw up again. I'm like, oh, okay, that let's, I think in the sense know that Brie doesn't have to focus on being perfect. And that if she does screw up again, cause it's most likely gonna happen, then she has her friend Rue to call her out on it. And you know, and I think that healthy call out is part of what makes relationships between like real allies and like performative allies different. Mm -hmm. uh, so if I'm yep. surrounded by a group of friends who I know are going to make mistakes, but there is space and room in our friendship for me to be able to say, hey, this is messed up and this is why, like yeah. it's not cool. Like, I think that's important because if you, if I have to hold up a mask to my friends, then how, then are we friends? Or am I just friends with them and they're not truly able to see me? Um, I lost a lot of friends, not a lot, but I lost a handful of friends in 2020 um, because of things happening in the world and, and my stance on it. I, I had, you know, then white friends say to me, well, you never talked about this before. Like you're different now. And I'm like, no, I didn't talk about it with you. Yeah. And it, it was just one of those moments where it's like, we have to be able to talk about these things with our, yeah. with our friends who are, if they're going to be friends and they're outside of the black community, we have to be able to talk about these things openly. And so I think that's what that, um, that's what that line in there was for. Yeah, I yeah. think it was very powerful. Things need to change. And so that's the only way it's going to. Yeah, just to be able to listen and accept feedback, you know, and, and realize that you're not perfect and, and you need to change. Yeah, I love that. Um, I think that leads really well into the next question. Like, how, how do you keep your characters well-rounded? I think you did a really great job with that, with Brie especially. Um, I think it's important that none of the characters are um, expressly perfect. It's important for me to understand that um, each character has something to learn because you're getting a snapshot of a person's life. And I don't think there's any human alive whose life you can sort of jump into especially teenagers, jump into, I mean, adults too, right? You can't jump into any human's life for a, a snippet and a glimpse and not see that they are, that there are flaws there, that there are areas where they need to grow, that there's elements of sort of blindness in their willingness to face certain things. Like everyone sort of has the things that they're working on and areas that they're growing in. And I think that's sort of the point of life, right? 
And so um, it's important to me to bring that authenticity to my characters by making sure that I understand what those flaws are. And it's important for me that every single person is makes mistakes. Mm -hmm. I didn't really get into Miss Leola's mistakes, but she certainly has some. Like I deeply explored her past and there wasn't really space for it on the page, but she definitely has a past and you're gonna see more um, sort of gray characters in the sequel as well. Mm -hmm. I really yeah. love this idea that, um, you know, you can't really size up a person by looking at one or two of their actions, right? Like we're far more complex than that as people. And I think characters read real when they also encompass that complexity. Yeah, for so sure. Taking them flaws in a sense and making them all rounded out. You also do a really good job at like having the goals always on the page. Is there, I mean, obviously you do it intentionally, but is there a trick or a tip you have for somebody that to get that on the page? Um, you know, it's funny you say that because in the book I'm currently writing, I just got feedback from my dear, one of my dear best friends, um, who's also a freelance editor. And she's like, I know you're going to hate me for this. But this whole section does not have any goals. <laughs> and I think honestly, it's like constantly, um, I don't think it's something that you can do by yourself. I think writing is a collaborative process. And I think that we yeah. accomplish our best work by collaborating with others. And I think that goes in all things. I think that goes in the jacket copy on the cover of the book, you know, when, when we collaborate, the, the um, film adaptation of a movie, like when, when the team collaborates with the author, you know, you see really cool adaptations because the writer's involved. So you have all these different brains at the table, which is like, you know, that's still like, anyway, so that's my soapbox. But yes, I think having multiple eyes on your work and getting different perspectives on your work um, and really understanding how, I think understanding scene level writing is really important. I think it just takes practice. I think there are things that we need to write in our story because we need to understand them, but not because they need to be on the page. And so a lot of times I think that writers get caught up into what do I need to write versus like, well, there's two things I see. What do I need to write? And you can sort of hit a wall because you're like, well, I, I love this idea of the scene, but it, it doesn't have a goal or it's not connected to the plot, but they feel compelled to write it. And then I see the flip side of that where they write everything they feel, feel compelled to write. And it's like, but there's no story here because there's no like main plot thread. And I think it's really understanding the, your creation process. Um, for my current series that I'm working on, not Wings of Ebony, but the next one, I've written 80, uh, sorry, 100, but 126,000 words of this story and all the different parts, like 20,000 of those are backstory for one of the antagonists wow. that, you, that will never make it into the book. 83,000 is like my zero draft of the story just to explore the world building. I'm using none of it, but all of it needed to happen because what I'm trying to accomplish with this world and this magic, I'm creating this sort of like larger world, like, like something of like the Grishaverse, right? Like something big and broad. So I needed to get my hands wet and I know my creative process well enough to know I'm not gonna be able to write goal oriented scenes unless I understand what's happening around my characters. And to explore that, I had to write non-goal oriented scenes and just play. And so I think allowing yourself to really understand how your brain creates and gets to usable content is really important and understanding that can be very different from the next person and that's okay. Being mm -hmm. patient to really give each book what it needs, um, I think is also helpful because there are gonna be times, like I said, I, yesterday I wrote like three love scenes between these two characters and I know I have to cut two of them, but I needed to like explore their connection and why they're drawn to each other. And I picked out the one that was like the most passionate, you know, and so um, be willing to sort of do work and undo work to sort of braid the fibers and then unbraid them, you know, um, and I think that that really helps. Once you get to the end of that though, when you are sort of, it's time to do your cutting, which is a different step from exploring the story. I think you do have to go scene by scene and say, what does my character want in the scene? How does the character, um, how is the character driven forward in their character arc um, by the plot in the scene? And uh, my critique partner, Emily is my critique partner, um, who's also an editor and she's just really brilliant. She knows my work, she's read everything I've ever written and she's really good at spotting when I don't do that. So having really good critique partners who know your style, like if you can work with each other on several projects, you get into a good synergy because they understand your writing your work. It's kind of like working with your editor at your publisher. So having, you know, good support staff, a support team, and then really understanding when is it time to focus and have goal-oriented scenes, and when is it time to just play, and being okay with it, with that process. Really good information. Interesting. <laughs> yeah. So you talked a little bit about world building. Um, what advice would you give to other writers, and, and how to world, like, build a creative world? Oh, man. Okay, so this could be an entire masterclass, which many people would teach far better than me. 
But the little bit that I've picked up is I, well, and I write contemporary fantasy, so there's that. But I love this idea of taking things that are familiar and giving them like slight tweaks and features that make them slightly unfamiliar. I love the idea that you can ground magic in sort of an, an undercurrent of understanding that's rooted in something that makes sense. So like in my magic school book, which is a middle grade series that comes out in May from Bloomsbury, I wanted, there, there's a magic school and one of the types of specialties is potions. And I wanted making potions to be like cooking. And so what I did was instead of like world building exactly how, you know, potions work, I decided to mirror the sort of practice of that with the practice of cooking so that the reader walks in with a sort of inherent understanding of how the magic works and you're just giving it different names and then you're giving it different outcomes. And so you're sort of taking what a reader understands and you're just sort of creating this fantastical element that's slightly adjacent to it. So they can kind of suspend their disbelief and go, oh, this is kind of like cooking, but, but different in this way. And um, I think that that's sort of my approach typically is to um, create accessible fantasy. That's really important to me because I didn't see myself in a lot of fantasy. And so I want to create worlds that are very contemporary grounded, but that, you know, being contemporary grounded doesn't um, like sacrifice world building. So I've, I've been trying to sort of write in this way where, you know, contemporary readers and fantasy readers alike can get involved in my books and find that magic accessible and the fantasy readers can find it, you know, delicious and engaging as well. Book two actually in Wings of Ebony has way more magic than book one, so. Oh, wow, it's exciting. <laughs> One thing that you really did amazing with your magic system is there's a lot of restrictions and there's a lot of complications. Magic just can't just fix everything. So what, I mean, that's, I think, one of the things that makes a magic system work so well. But what other tips do you have for somebody creating a magic system? One of my favorite tips is from Sanderson. Like, I'm not an expert on anything, but Sanderson has this first rule of something. I can't think of a name, but um, I absolutely love it. And as a contemporary writer, I like to write stories with commentary. In book one of Wings of Ebony, I wanted to make sure that the commentary was front and center. And Rue's arc, it was very important to me that her magic was intricately connected with her identity because my book is one of the pieces of commentary in that story is about understanding who you are and what you're capable of. And so it was important for me for my magic to not just exist for the sake of existing, but to be purposed in the message of the book. And one of the things Sanderson talks about is this idea that if your magic, I'm probably butchering this, please Google this if this is interesting to you, but it's, it's really mm -hmm. helpful. But it's one of these things where if your magic is part of sort of the solution and like the, the end of this, like what solves the problem of the story, then readers need to intricately understand how, how it works. If ultimately the magic functionally is not what solves the problem, then your readers don't need as depth of an understanding of how the magic works. And I think that's really helpful because magic can serve different purposes. Magic is a manifestation of Rue's inner belief in herself and um, her acceptance of who she is fully. And an extension of that is like what she's capable of because of who she is and where she comes from. And so it wasn't functionally about, well, how does this potion work with this potion? Or how does this spell get tweaked? Or how do we mix these spells and potions to beat this antagonist? That wasn't the core of the story, though that would have been fantastically cool. That wasn't the point of this book. Um, I think we do see, I wanted to play with a different scenario in book two. So you see, oh, no spoilers. Uh, you see, you see magic manipulated and used in ways that it shouldn't be that haven't been explored in book one and the ripple effect of that, um, which I think is really fun um, as well. And so in that book, you do need to understand a little bit more about how magic works. So you get a little bit more backstory of what magic was like when the island was colonized and all of that. So. It's, you know, I think magic needs to serve the purpose of the story and not just sort of be one feature you throw in. And it definitely does. And Wings of Ebony, I mean, I don't want to give away anything, but yeah, later on you find out just how much the magic affects Rue and how it's it, mm -hmm. her identity in a sense. But yeah, I loved that. When I found that out, I'm like, just like almost like a plot twist. I'm like, oh my gosh, okay, here we go. <laughs> and for Rue too, because she's of course shocked, right? Well, like what? <laughs> so yeah. I think it's so important though. And I think it's such a powerful message to particularly black teen readers who need to understand that they are magic and that they possess it and that they can wield it. So that is the purpose of magic serves in that book. And 
I think that it's just important when we evaluate books and like digest them, it's important to like give consideration to what the point of the story is and sort of what the magic and world serves. Cause not all books are, not all book magic systems and worlds serve the same purpose. And I think that's the beauty of literature from all different like walks of life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Um, what would you recommend uh, writers do to keep tension like you've done in your book from chapter to chapter? I, so first of all, just know this is like candy to me. I love talking craft. I could talk craft all day. It's my favorite thing. Um, and I, it's, I mean, I don't, I still have so much to learn. It's not like I know everything, but I just love, like I love learning and strategizing and analyzing things. And so this is just like fun. So I appreciate you all doing this. Um, tension is rooted in conflict. And the thing about it is, is conflict can be a battle, but conflict can also be a disagreement between a daughter and her mother. Conflict can be, I, I'm socially anxious and I walk into a mini mart and there are people everywhere. Conflict is just something that grates against, you know, you need two things grating against each other. And I think that's the secret of tension. So looking at your scenes and seeing, okay, what is my source of tension in this book? And it, it's rooted in sort of your scene level structure. So it's in this scene, my character is going after X, what stops them from that? What obstacles do they run into? That's your conflict, that's your tension. And that's what keeps your pages turning. Hmm. For sure, I think you said that really well. I love that. Yeah. Always look for other ways to like add conflict and tension. Mm -hmm. um, well, I've noticed a lot with YA and YA fantasy that more recently it's being told in first person present tense. Is that something that you decided or was that something the uh, publisher asked you to change later on or did you know it was first person present tense? I like writing in first person present. I okay. have an advice. Um, but I wanted to write this book in first person present because I wanted the kids that I'm writing for, like my teenage sisters who are 14 and 15 and particularly black teen readers, I want them to read this book and, and see themselves in Rue to the point that they're reading I, 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 hoping that subliminally when Rue believes in herself and realizes what she's capable of, they do in some sort of magical way as well. So mm -hmm. you're strategic about it, interesting. Very cool. I love that. That gave me chills just a little bit. I know. <laughs> So um, what advice do you have for someone who's wanting to write diverse characters, both in main point of view and secondary characters? Um, voices or like people who want to write outside their identity? I got both questions. So mainly like I had somebody ask as a white author, how do they write a person of diversity like um, in a sensitive way that's not going to come off rude? And we've heard too like, if you're white, like writing a mean point of view of somebody of color isn't necessarily a good idea because how can you honestly know what they've been through? So then how do they, if they're wanting to have their main person be somebody white, but then introducing secondary characters? Because obviously you don't want a book of just white people if you're white. Right, right. right. We want books that reflect the world that we live in. Yeah. Um, so I'll say this, there are many answers to this and I, and I will always preface anything I say with I'm not an expert. Like I am literally, my personal brand is hashtag hot mess because I'm a hot mess all the time. So please know that nothing I say is like perfect or any sort of like, you know, I'm going to tell you what I know, but please go ask other people too. <laughs> what I, what I like to, I have a, a critique partner of mine, not, not um, Emily, a different one who is doing something similar. I think the first question isn't how, I think it's why. And I think it's uh, writers have to sort of really do some internal digging to understand why they wanna do that. I think that you know they need to be really honest with themselves about if they're doing it for the right reasons. Are they doing it because they think their book will sell more? Are they doing it because they think it's you know trendy? Like it's really important that when you're putting a person in your story, you do so with care, whoever they are, like side characters, main characters, whoever they are. And so I think, that's the first question is why you're doing it. And again, no one can really tell you your true intentions, but I think people in general have a gut feeling about why they wanna do something. And what I would say, cause I do have a friend who I know wants to do this and she wants to do it for really, really good reasons. Um, you can wanna do something for good reasons and still be terrified to do it wrong. Those two things can happen. Those two emotions can exist at the same time. So know that. I think the next part of it though, is to understand that that fear of doing it wrong is a good thing because it means that you care. It means that you truly care. If you're overly confident in your ability to write someone else's representation, that's that's concerning for me personally. Um, I think you need support around you and you need to understand how well you take feedback because um, if you have people around you who, from that community that you know and you seek out feedback from them, you have to be someone who's going to take and receive that feedback. Even if you don't fully understand it or you disagree with some of the parts, 
you have to realize that you don't see the world the way that person does. And nothing you do is going to change that because you are not them. And I think once you realize that it, it take, it's, it's almost like setting aside your, your pride. I think as writers, we have to be proud of our skill and that's important, but you gotta know what you don't know. And I think that it's really important that you know, okay, I don't know how to do this. And you have to truly humbly, I think, take instruction on that and constantly assess your motives. One of the people I think who does this fantastically is Jodi Pico. So pick up her books, read about them, Google these topics and read about the common mistakes authors make when they're writing outside of their own identity. Um, because I think there's a lot of damage and harm that can be done when it's not done carefully. And it's not just something you execute carefully. It is something that you constantly execute and reevaluate and get feedback on and revise and, and keep going. I think it also involves really understanding and doing research um, on the community that you want to write about, but understanding that as much as your research, you're still not them. And I think that that is sort of what I see most often is I see people research really, really well. But there's still this dissonance and they don't see it. And I think that's really important to understand. And I actually explore this a little bit in um, Wings 2. Uh, you see some of this from Brie because from Brie, Brie is still working on growing. Um, and I just think that's important that even if you don't fully see it, at least intellectually understand that there's dissonance there that you may not grasp. And you really have to rely on a team around you. If you don't have a team around you to help you with that, I mean, honestly, I just don't think it's a good idea, <laughs> personally. I mean, if you're planning to publish a book, obviously you have an editor and you have these people around you, but it's important that the people that are giving you feedback understand that those communities you're writing about firsthand. That's really, really important. And one thing I'll say that I think is also really helpful is that you need to get multiple opinions you don't sort of get a license to write a black character any way you want. If you have one black friend who's like, oh, that's great. Like, that's not how that works. Um, it takes more intention than that and understanding, um, first of all, who are you talking with and do they understand? That? So I think it's important to understand that there's, you know, you need to take in multiple opinions and you need to take opinions from people who understand the situation out there. So I have no doubt, just to throw my sweet mom under the bus with a fictitious example, if she would have read XYZ book with this sort of tokenized black character, she's like, oh my goodness, I'm so glad to see some black kids in the book and he's so cute and handsome. Right, mom, but did you catch all of these problematic things, how he's written as a caricature, how he does these sort of like stereotypical black kid things and he doesn't seem like a real person? She probably was like, no, I, I, no, I didn't get that. Because a lot of that impact is subliminal, right? And so I think it's important that you, when you have resources around you, those resources are people who, who know what you're trying to do and understand the weight of that so that they can give you an informed opinion. Um, and they, you know, I think there are people, there are sensitivity readers, there are people who sort of steep themselves in this, in this conversation. And so I think it's important to get as many of those opinions as possible um, and not just like one or two is like a pass or a band-aid. So. Yeah, that's excellent mm -hmm. advice, yeah. Okay, uh, so I saw in another interview that you did on iWriterly and Alexis Dawn channel um, where you're talking about, you kind of talked about earlier, but your new middle grade series book. We actually got a lot of questions on that. So you must've already done a lot of marketing for it because a lot of people are curious about it. And I, I think you said it comes out in May, is that right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so contemporary fantasy. Can you tell us a little bit more about the books and what to expect from them? Sure, so Park Row Magic Academy is a middle grade series about a magic school in the back of a beauty shop. And so book one, which is out with Bloomsbury in May, um, is about Kiana who learns she's a witch um, and she learns the big family secret, which is that she's a witch and she enrolls in um, magic school and she has to sort of um, pick her specialty and decide what she's going to do. And, you know, she has a nemesis there who's also uh, someone at her school that she didn't know was also magical. And so um, it's really fun to sort of explore the world and the magic. And she ends up being presented with this huge dilemma because the school is threatened to being shut down because of redistricting and gentrification. So always commentary in my books. Um, and it requires Kiana to really understand fully what she's capable of um, and sort of lean into sort of what she's, you know, her skill set to make it better. Only making it better involves many, many, many mistakes. And so it's Kiana learning um, how to um, overcome this, those mistakes and um, understanding that she belongs in this little magic world and that she is, she, well, I don't want to ruin that spoiler. But anyway, it's understanding that mistakes are a part of it, a part of the journey, a part of the process and growing. Um, it's really fun. It's whimsical. It's laugh out loud funny. Like it's ridiculously 
wild. There are talking windows. There's a stove that spits out pizzas on demand. His name is Lou. There's like, it's just, it's like when anytime my editor sends me notes on that book or an email about the book or anything about the book, I just start smiling because it's just joyful. It's so joyful. Has beautiful representation, which is really fun. Um, I have, let's see, I have a non-binary character in there. I have um, the main character is Kiana, she's black. Um, and then she has two friends and one of them is Latinx and the other one is a black boy as well. Um, and so I'm just really excited about being able to center kids with these marginalizations in a magic school um, because I've never seen anything like that before, so. That'll be so exciting and like something that they need, I would think, you know, definitely will be a good time for it. Yeah, that sounds awesome. I love the pizzas. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody wants a, 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 a loose stove. Loose right. I need one of those. <laughs> what tips would you have for someone who wants to write a middle grade magic school book? Oh man. You know, middle grade is so different from YA. Um, a lot of the audience is to school library and just younger kids in general. And I think that one of the things I love about magic about middle grade is that it's um, there's just at least in my middle grade, there's just less plot threads. And so I really enjoy having more fun with it um, because I can sort of go deeper because it's like uh, fewer plot threads that I need to explore and flesh out. Um, so I really love that about middle grade. In terms of making a magic school, goodness, I think it's the freshness of the magic school that makes it really cool and feel new. And I think that's what people love about magic schools is it's sort of this sort of like you know, it's, it's, it makes you think of sort of the first day of school and it's how it's a new grade and you don't know what to expect and you're going to learn all of these cool things you've never heard of before. And so I think really developing a school that has all kinds of fun new things that feel different from other things that we've, that we've seen in magic school books is what gives it that sort of freshness. So maybe starting there. Magic schools, I think, are so dependent on world building that I probably would start with really creating something fun for your world and just getting inspired and just letting your creativity go wild in that space and then building your story, um, which not is not the way everybody works. And then building your story, sort of like, what story do you want to tell in that whimsical world? Um, and, a, you know, making tweaks as needed. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Interesting. I can't wait for it to come out. That'll be so fun. Thank you. I'm excited about it. So um, for our last question, I got a lot of questions obviously on Wings of Ebony. So people are wanting to know how the sequel is coming and if you can tell us when it will come out. It's done, it's out in January. Um, and I'm I'm assuming the cover will be revealed, um, let's see, last year, I think we revealed the cover in August. So I imagine the sequel cover will be revealed like late summer, early fall. I'm not sure, but somewhere around there. So we should see, but I mean, it's rolling. I mean, I need to do past pages, but it's it's mm -hmm. been a cover. The last iteration I saw of it was very close to final. So I'm excited. Oh, I can't wait. So January, you said, 2022. January, 2022. Okay, mm -hmm. perfect. Put that on your calendars, people. <laughs> well, thank you so much for joining us, uh, JL. We look forward to speaking with you about marketing strategies next week, next Wednesday. Uh, be sure to check out Wings of Ebony. It is sold on Amazon and your local bookstores. And make sure to like, subscribe, and ring the bell so you'll be notified when our next video is up. Thanks, guys. Bye-bye. Yeah.